Good morning. I sure do love you all. Most of us remember the devastation that occurred in Haiti a decade ago from a really powerful earthquake. I remember reading a story on CNN that week about a man who was rescued from the rubble and survived for 11 days on a can of soda. 11 days. It's a really long time with one can of soda. Can you imagine how thirsty he must have felt? Or what that first sip of water felt like when he finally got to take a drink? Now this is an extreme physical thirst, but there's a thirst that's felt so much deeper within the souls of humanity. It exists within each one of us. There's a thirst to be loved. There's a thirst to be accepted. There's a thirst to be seen. In May, the Surgeon General put words to this thirst and declared an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. We see this thirst of loneliness all around us. We can be in a group of people and be profoundly lonely and not realize that the person sitting next to us is also profoundly lonely. We see this in men, women, children. We even see this thirst of loneliness staring back at us from the mirror. It's also a thirst we see in our story today. John chapter 4 records the story of a wounded woman. We find her at the well, which was a common place to find women in that day and age. But she was there at the sixth hour. And this was a very unusual time to find a woman at the well for multiple reasons. In a hot climate, In the age before air conditioning, it made so much sense to go early in the morning. Women, would we rather go in the middle of the day to do physical labor and sweat it out, or would we be smart and go early in the morning? Right? I'm right. Yes. So it just doesn't make much sense that this woman was going in the hottest part of the day to do this physical labor. But we find her here at the well at noon. And we also discover that she's alone. After I graduated from college quite a while ago, I lived in Mali, West Africa for two years. And this beautiful and primitive culture does not know the convenience, even in the 21st century, of running water. Every morning, As the sun's rising and the roosters are continuing to crow, women of all ages, from little girls to older women, begin their trek to the common well. And yes, I made multiple attempts to try to join in and haul water, but I always ended up with more water on me than in my bucket. It's a real skill. Despite the laborious effort to haul water from a well to their hut, There's so much laughing and conversation that's happening. And that's because all these women, they know each other. They're together. They're excited to catch up on maybe the previous news from the the previous day. It's a time to be with friends. It's a time to be with family. And these women help each other. As you might imagine, it's very difficult work to get a large container of water onto a woman's head. It takes a group of women to do that for each other. They're there, they're socializing, they're having fun, and they're helping each other do the work. I imagine it was also this way for the culture we find in the book of John. Knowing this shows us to an even greater extent the void which it must have been within this woman. She felt that she was such an outcast that she could not even join the other women of her village to draw water in community. 
She chose instead to go alone and not be seen. Do you know this woman? Perhaps she's part of your family, a friend, a coworker. Perhaps she is you. This woman's surprise must have been great then when she realized that she was actually not alone. Not only is someone with her, but it's a man. Now, having had five husbands and another lover, we know that she's had a lot of experience with men in her life, and we can assume that she instinctively felt defensive and suspicious to encounter a man by himself at the well in the middle of the day. This man was Jesus. When he notices her there, he doesn't pretend like he doesn't see her or walk the other way. No, he chooses to see her. He actually sees her. And as he sees her, he knows her thirst. He knows her marital history. He knows her shame. He knows about all of her sin. He knows her loneliness. He knows how different she is from him. Yet despite his sight, or perhaps in spite of his sight, he speaks to her and he asks her for a drink. Jesus is the most beautiful of ministers. He meets this woman where she is and simply notices her and begins to talk to her. And by doing so, he begins to build a bridge in order to quench the thirst of her loneliness and shame. So often in our culture, we ask people who want to join our community to be exactly like we are. We want you here if you'll be just like us. But Jesus shows us another way. His example is one of love, acceptance, and diversity. He is loving the one who is wounded, the one who is lonely, shamed, and thirsty. He meets her where she is. Do you know this man? Has he met you in your time of loneliness or shame and quenched your thirst? He longs to meet you where you are and tell you that you do, in fact, belong. You, you belong. As the woman hears the words come out of the mouth of Jesus, she realizes that this is not only a man, but a Jewish man. And she is a Samaritan. In shock, she asks him, okay, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman? How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. I mean, everyone knows this. She knew her culture. She knew the taboos of this Jewish man talking to her, a Samaritan woman, and she called him out on it. She questioned him. We can hear her distrust, her suspicion. This verse is rich an example of what we might learn from Jesus. He crossed the tallest and widest of boundaries in order to talk to this woman that her culture had deemed as an outcast, someone on the fringes. Now, we know in our American culture the evils of racism and bias, and we see how it rips and tears people's lives apart. And Christ's culture was not a whole lot different from our own. In fact, the tensions might have been even greater. Even Jews who did tolerate other religions remained disdainful of Samaritans and referred to them as half-breeds. And to this day, if a son or daughter from a strict Jewish household marries a Gentile, his or her funeral is carried out. As an American woman, I know my freedom, but I also recognize that there still exists a certain inequality 
between men and women. But I have no way in which to even imagine what life was actually like for this Samaritan woman. In her day, it was not acceptable for a man to talk to a woman in public, even if this woman was his own wife, much less a complete stranger with a very questionable history. There even existed a group of men known as the bruised and bleeding Pharisees, who in attempts to protect their holiness, closed their eyes so that when they saw a woman, they became bruised and bleeding because they kept bumping and walking into walls and houses. Right? And we are certainly all aware of the history of tension between Christianity and Islam. There are numerous boundaries that have been set up in light of our current world situation. History tells us that a similar war, so to speak, existed between the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Samaritans. They did not intermingle because of religious reasons. Pharisees were so bent on protecting their religious superiority that they built walls in order to deem those they felt less holy than them out of their lives. Samaritans, in reaction to the Pharisees, believed they truly were religiously inferior. They'd heard this message so many times that they internalized it. It was embedded in them. They believed it. And so they built their own walls to protect themselves and to block themselves in. What boundaries of insecurity, individualism, materialism has Christ crossed over in order to meet you where you are today? What prejudice exists in your life that you've built in order to keep those who you deem less than you out? Or what boundaries of shame and guilt and loneliness have you built that are trapping you in? Jesus allows this woman to belong. He knows she has regrets. Yet in unconditional love, grace, and acceptance, He moves beyond her sin, beyond her shame, breaks through the barriers that exist, and offers her the opportunity to believe. He offers her the opportunity to be loved. He's seen her with his eyes, and he's talked to her with his voice, and he now ministers to her from his heart. And Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Seeing her thirst, Christ offers her eternal fulfillment as he shares his love, his salvation, his very life with her. Are you in a place right now where the thirst within you is unbearable? Christ offers you living water. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've known that feeling of thirst but you've also experienced the life-giving water of Christ. Who around here, who around us, is dying of thirst while we sit here fulfilled? Christ is no longer walking among us in physical form, but he is alive and his presence is near. In fact, It may seem overwhelming, but he's called and enabled us to be his hands, his feet, his presence in the world around us. During my college years, 
I began to pray this prayer. Lord, help me to be your hands. Help me to be your feet. At the time, I don't even know if I really knew what I was praying. But I discovered an answer to that prayer when I was living in Africa. I was surrounded by beautiful, ebony faces speaking a language I could not understand. I had moved well beyond my comfort zone. My white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes were a physical reflection of the differences and boundaries that went so much deeper than my skin. I was surrounded by poverty and pain, and I sat helplessly by and watched as death ravaged generations and stole the lives of babies, children, men, and women. I could feel their pain, but it felt like there was nothing I could do. And still that prayer continued to echo in my mind. Lord, make me your hands. Make me your feet. Use me as your presence in this world. I remember the day as if it were today. I can see every detail. Mamadou, my closest Malian friend, approached me and asked me to visit a sick friend of his in the village. That was not uncommon, so I readily agreed. That afternoon, as we approached the man's courtyard, my eyes fell upon an elderly, leprous man sitting outside. Assuming this was the man I came to visit, I walked up to him and introduced myself, only to find that it was actually that man's son, Bala, that Mamadou wanted me to see. He then led me into a hut, and the sight that I saw there just tore at my heart. On a bamboo mat on the floor lay the frame of a grown man, and he was so emaciated I can still remember seeing the outline of his heart as it was beating in his chest. I stood watching, breathless, helpless, and as I sought to maintain my composure, I heard the soft voice of his elderly father pleading with me to take, my, take his son to the hospital. God, make me your hands. Use me as your presence. Not much time had passed, and I found myself in the hospital with my new friend lying on a metal-framed, dirty mattress before me. The hospital was so raw, it didn't have running water, there was no electricity or any cleanliness of any kind. And by the glow of a flashlight, I was asked to help begin an IV in the arm of Bala. Several weeks passed, and I regularly visited my new friend and his wife and his family in the hospital. And while there, we sang together. I prayed for them when they asked me to. I held his cup so he could spit in it. I bore witness to their suffering. I was with them in their time of pain. Those few weeks of visiting and praying and building a friendship led to one of the most monumental experiences of my life. It came to a crashing climax on the day when I drove up to the hospital to see a crowd of Malians crowded outside. My friend looked at me and told me that this was very bad. Not understanding, I got out of the truck and moved toward the entrance of the hospital and my friend's hospital room. Before I could enter, however, I was embraced by his wife, and she threw herself on me, and she began wailing. He's dead. He's dead. Bala died only minutes before I arrived. Holding his wife as she wailed and tore her clothes, she looked at me and she thanked me for helping her, for helping her husband, for praying to my God for them, for being with them, for being with them in that tough space. She then asked me if I would drive her husband's body back to their hut. God, make me your hands. Use me as your presence. Driving up to his hut, his elderly, leprous father walked up to the window of my truck and asked me, where is my son? I was forced to look into his worn eyes and tell him that his son would not be coming home. The father began screaming and ran to the back of my truck and threw himself on his son's body. 
God, make me your hands. Make me your feet. Walking up to Bala's house, I was greeted by his two small children. Stooping down to their level, I looked into their beautiful faces, and I explained to them that their father had died, that he was not going to be able to come home. The wailing in the village was growing ever more intense, and I sat by feeling completely helpless. Minutes, hours later, I was approached again by Bala's elderly father, and he asked me if I would attend the funeral service the next day. Of course, I said I would be honored to to be there. And that morning, Bala's father came to me and proceeded to do something unheard of in that culture, especially for a foreign woman from another country that is white. He asked me to help bury his son. And so with a hollow place in my stomach and a shaky hand, I did just as he asked. I helped bury Bala. As I drove away, alone and in the quiet, I felt that presence of God, the Spirit of God, say to me, telling me, this is what it means. This is what it means to be my hands and my feet. This is what it means to be my presence. It's when you know you're doing something that you can't do alone. We can't sit with people in their pain on our own. We can't embrace people of all types on our own. Bala and his family taught me so much during that time, so many lessons. When we celebrate and honor our differences, we can show up for each other without judgment. People know they can trust us. And they invite us to be with them in these sacred spaces of suffering, joy, pain, hope, like Jesus did for the loneliest woman at the well. This is the work of healing the epidemic of loneliness and isolation, and we get to be part of that. God can take the most ordinary of people and work through the miracles of connection and care. God can use you and God can use me to cross the boundaries that exist in the world in order that those who are dying of thirst, suffering in loneliness, may know that they belong, that they are loved, and that the living water of Christ is available for each and every one of us. His gospel and his love are all-inclusive, is ours.